And again, we continue in our series of messages that we started right after Easter, looking at the seven letters of Jesus to the churches of Asia in the book of Revelation. We are on the last of the, of the seven. This is actually the eighth in the series. And this morning we're talking about the standing invitation. Uh, I want you to turn to Revelation. Uh, if you didn't bring a Bible, there's a few Bibles right in front of you. I want you to pull that out. I want you to turn to the last book in the Bible. Then I want you to go to chapter 3. I'm going to wait for a second, and when everyone has it, just tell me. Say God, when you are in Revelation chapter 3, just tell me so I know we can go on. Revelation chapter 3. Let's go do some pages slipping. Don't be afraid to say it out loud if you are saying it by yourself. Okay. I'm glad. Revelation 3. If you look there, you see that the church at Sardis is the first part of that chapter. And then Jesus addresses the church at Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love. But then he goes to the church at Laodicea in verse 14. And so we are going to be picking up in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. This is the last in our series of seven letters to Jesus. Let me tell you a little bit about Laodicea. Laodicea was a very wealthy city founded by Antipas II and named after his life, Laodicea. The city was strategically located well, where three highways converged, and so Laodicea was a highly commercial community. It was well known for its banking industry. It was a manufacturer of black wool, and, it, and there was a medical school there that produced an eye ointment that was highly valued. The wealth in the city had been used to build theaters, a huge stadium, public baths, and fabulous shopping centers. Does that sound familiar? Kind of sounds like a typical large American city, doesn't it? So wealthy was this city that when an earthquake almost entirely destroyed Laodicea in, 80, in 60 AD, its wealthy citizens refused any help or assistance from Rome in rebuilding the city. Now, if you were a real estate agent at that time and you were living near Laodicea, you wouldn't have any problem with income because it wouldn't be hard to sell property in Laodicea. It was a great place to live. It was a land of opportunity. Does that sound familiar? The only real negative about Laodicea was its lack of an adequate water supply. And we'll talk more about their water supply and how important it was to them in just a little bit. The church at Laodicea was most likely founded by the Apostle Paul. He actually wrote a letter to them that was lost, and it's referred to in Colossians 4.16. We have never seen the letter to the church of the Laodiceans, but there was a letter written uh, to that church, just like Paul wrote letters to Colossae and to Corinth and to Rome. Uh, and as we get into the text this morning, it's going to be very apparent that Christians here in Laodicea have become victims of their own environment. And because of that, the lessons learned at Laodicea are lessons for American Christians today. I want you to understand this. Jesus would rather see us as refreshing as a cup or a mug of hot coffee that will ward off winter's chill. Or he would rather see us as cool as an ice cold drink on a summer day. But Jesus will not put up with a lukewarm church. Nor will he put up with lukewarm Christians. It's kind of like the old Peanuts illustration of the Peanuts comics. You know, Charles Schultz has been gone quite a few years, but his comics still continue in the papers. Lucy comes to her little brother Linus, and she walks in, and she changes the TV channel. Actually, she says, switch channels. And Linus just sits there and ignores her. And she said, I said, switch channels. I want to watch my program. And Linus looks at her and he says, are you kidding? What makes you think that you can just walk right in here and take over? And this is what Lucy says. She said, see these five fingers? Individually, they're nothing. But when I curl them like this, they become a single unit, and they form a weapon that is terrible to behold. And 
Lionel stands up and says, what channel do you want? And he sighs. And then he looks at his own hand and he says, why can't you guys get organized like that? You see, a church that is lukewarm is a hand that's unorganized. It's a hand that doesn't have a purpose and it doesn't have a mission and it can't accomplish its full potential. It's a church that just bounces along and does church. And Jesus, Jesus wants us to understand that we need to get a little better organized. We need to be either hot or cold. Let's take a look at these verses. Revelation chapter 3. First of all, let's understand that this letter is from Jesus himself. This letter is from the great I Am. Verse 14 says, To the angel of the church at Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. You know, there is no congratulations, there is no commendation to the Laodiceans. In all the other six letters that were written to the previous six churches, Jesus had something good to say about them. He commended them for something. He complimented them on their hard work or on their, on, on their faithfulness or on, on their stability. He had something good to say, but not with the Laodiceans. With the Laodiceans, he comes out the gate and he says, I am the great I am. I am the one. I am the amen. I am the faithful and the true witness. I am the ruler of God's creation. You better pay attention to who's talking to you. Because it's the one who always has been and is and will be. In the Greek, the amen means I'm the firm one, I'm the stable one, I'm the sure one, I'm established, I'm trustworthy. Have you ever wondered why we always tend to say amen at the end of our prayers? We say amen because we are saying this is trustworthy, this is established. So be it, God. Let it be. There's a real affirmation in the word amen. And Jesus is the one who is saying, I am the amen. Who's on trial here? Who is he talking to? He's talking to this church, the church at Laodicea. Who's the key witness in the trial? The key witness in the trial is Jesus Christ himself. And so there can be no excuses. It's time to take an honest examination, followed by honest repentance and a genuine desire for them to change their life. Here is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who's speaking to them, and he's saying, I'm holding you accountable. Wow. Wow. This letter is from the great I am. But then in verse 15, he goes on and he says, you know, I really know you and I know you well. In verse 15, he says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot, and I wish that you were one or the other. I know you better than you imagine that I know you. Jesus knows our deeds, both, both individually, and he knows our deeds as a church. This has to be a sobering reminder to us to examine ourselves on a regular basis. There's a couple of other passages that come to mind here. In Mark 4.22, Jesus said, Nothing is hidden except it is to be revealed, nor has anything been done in secret that it won't come to light. He knows us. He knows us. You know, we teach our kids a Christmas, a little Christmas ditty. Santa Claus is coming to town. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. So be good for what? For goodness sake, we know the song. And so, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of a, a, a reminder to the kids. Hey, Santa's watching. And if Santa's watching, you better be a good boy or a good girl. Guess what? Jesus has always, always been watching. He knows us. He examines us. Nothing is hidden from his sight. Paul said this in Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything we do needs to be pointing to Him. And here is Jesus, the King, the Creator of the universe, the one who is the great I Am, the one who is the Amen, and He says to the Laodiceans, you're lukewarm. You know, this is probably one of the most familiar passages in the book of Revelation. You hear this, uh, this uh, part of Revelation 3 quoted many times. You're lukewarm. I'd rather have you hot or I'd rather have you cold, but because you're lukewarm, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. 
Let's talk a little bit about lukewarmness. A lukewarm church is a church that just goes through the motions. It's a church that gathers to worship mindlessly. There is no heart. There is no zeal. There is no focus in the worship. When they sing, it's just words. And when they pray, when they study, and when they remember the Lord at the Lord's table, their minds simply wander. Did your mind wander yet this morning? Is it wandering right now? Have we lost our focus? They don't worry about spreading the gospel. They let someone else visit the sick. They know that there's organizations in town that are supposed to take care of those in need. And so a church that is lukewarm is a church that just bounces along and lets the other guy do it. The verse 15 says, Jesus said, I know your deeds. In particular, I know that you're lukewarm. And I wish that you were hot. Or I wish that you were cold. Now, what's he mean by that? We usually think about it this way. Well, Jesus wants us all hot, doesn't he? He wants us all on fire. That's the good thing, isn't it? I really don't understand why he said I'd rather have you cold. Because if you're cold, you're, you're, not, you're not really with me. You're, you, 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 you give a chilling effect. Is that what he's really saying? Here's the deal in Laodicea. I mentioned earlier they had a water problem. There were hot springs some miles away. There were cool mountain springs some other miles away, but Laodicea didn't have a water supply. In order for Laodicea to have its water, Rome built viaducts. And the water was transported in these, in these overhead viaducts many miles. And that refreshing hot bath that you could have gotten just some miles away, by the time that water arrived in Laodicea, wasn't hot anymore. Likewise, the cool mountain water that could have been uh, such a refreshing thing on a hot day, by the time it got to Laodicea, had warmed up. And so the waters in Laodicea were lukewarm. They were just tepid. They weren't reaching their full potential. And Jesus said, I wish you were hot or I wish you were cold. That water was piped in from six miles out. And by the time it got there, it just basically kept the person alive. Wouldn't you rather be hot on a winter's day and refresh the body? Wouldn't you rather be a nice cold drink in the heat of the summer and refresh the body? That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying that if we're simply going through the motions, if our heart is not in it, if we are not living and working for Christ every day of our lives, we are of no benefit to Him. He is about to spit us out of His mouth. That really scares me. Can I tell you something with the English translations? The word there is not spit you out of your mouth. The word is vomit. I'm about to vomit you from my belly because you so disagree with me. Wow. He's telling a church that. He's telling a congregation of people who just bounce along. I'm about to throw you up. This is what verses 16 and 17 say. Because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich. I have acquired wealth. And I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched and pitiful, poor and blind and naked. I have judged you. And the word here means vomit. If a church has become of no spiritual benefit, if we as individuals are of no spiritual benefit, it makes Jesus so sick to his stomach that he can't contain it. We need to examine our own walk with Christ. Because Jesus knows our needs. Because there are no secrets. And we need to ask ourselves honestly, in a brutally honest way, where do we stand with him? There was a second spiritual problem within the church at Laodicea. Not only were they lukewarm, but Jesus said they had, been, had become infected with the love of material things. You think you're rich. You think you have it all. 
You think you live in a land of plenty. You think you have everything at your disposal. But you're poor. You're blind. You're naked. And you need to come to me for a cure. Compared to the rest of the world, I would say that people living in the United States of America and people living in Canada could be a modern day Laodicea. We think we have it all. And yet, yet, we need to see things with Jesus' eyes. And so he gives some advice. In verses 18 and 19, Jesus advises the church. He said, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined with fire, so that you become you can become rich, and white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes, so that you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke, and I discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here's my advice, Jesus said. If I'm going to give you any advice, if I'm going to give you anything, O church at Laodicea, I still love you. I still want you to be my church. So if I'm going to give you any advice, this is it. You need to learn from me. You're dead and you don't know. So if you're going to invest yourselves in wealth, buy gold from me. If you're going to try to wear the finest of clothes, get them from me. If you find yourself needing medical help, apply the salve that I give you. Remember I said earlier that Laodicea had a school of medicine and they were renowned throughout the Roman Empire for the medicinal helpfulness of the eye salve that they made there. So if you can't see, listen to me. Take from me. Apply what I give you. In other words, a true cure can be only found in Christ Jesus. There is no other cure. The world tells us there's all sorts of other solutions. But there is no other cure for the things that ail us than Jesus Christ and Him alone. And so we come down to the last part of, the, of this letter to the church, at the, the church at Laodicea. Jesus here now invites them. Yes, He has condemned them. He has advised them. But now He offers this invitation. He said there's still a chance. There's still hope. Out of the seven churches, you're the worst of the bunch because you think by maintaining the middle road, you're fine. But you're not. Here is what I want you to do. Here is my invitation. Verses 20 to 22. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right, Laodiceans. All right, Christians. You say you belong to me. You say you're well off, and neither is true. You don't belong to me. You belong to yourself. You're not well off. You may have what the world says makes you wealthy, but spiritually, you're smart. Here is my invitation. You're blinded by wealth. You have a love of material things. You are lukewarm. But I still love you and I want you to repent. And Jesus said, I am knocking at the door. Have you ever seen the portrait of Christ knocking at the door? We have one hanging downstairs in our, uh, on, on, by our kitchen in our small fellowship area. Have you ever noticed there's something on that door? That's missing? Someone tell me what's missing on the door. Door handle. Door knob. Door handle. There is no door pole for Jesus to come in. It is a flat door with nothing. And Jesus is knocking. Why is there no door, no, no door handle depicted in that painting? Because Jesus says, I am on the outside knocking. And if you hear me knock, and you hear my voice, it's up to you to open the door from the inside and let me in. Of 
quit playing around with your faith. Quit playing around with your Christianity. Quit being lukewarm. I am inviting you to come in. It's a persistent invitation. He said, Behold, I am continually knocking. It is a conditional invitation. If, if you hear me, it is an individual in, in, invitation. If any of you hear me, it is a selective invitation. It is given to the church. Jesus is speaking to the saved. Have you understood this? He is not inviting the unsaved to open their hearts to Jesus. He's talking to the ones who are already supposed to belong, who have strayed away. He said, I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still knocking. I still want you to be a part of me and me to be a part of you. And so this impressive invitation is given. I stand at your door and I knock. It is the Son of God. It is the Great I Am. It is the Wonderful Counselor, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the God of the universe who is knocking at the door of a Christian's heart and saying, quit being lukewarm. Let me in. It's Jesus. The Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, and the Savior of the world is knocking on the door of our hearts and saying, you have left me out. You're my church. Let me in. It is an ironclad invitation. Jesus did not say, I will come to you if you're good enough. He did not say, I will come in provided you've never done this or you've never done that. He did not say, I will come in if you promise never ever to do this again. No. He said, if you'll open the door, I'll come in. And we can start over. We can begin again. It is a challenging invitation. Because Jesus said, if you overcome, if you overcome to those who overcome, I will give you the right to sit with me on my throne. Our part to make this come to pass is to hear his voice and to open his door. His part is to give us his overcoming presence, his spirit again in our hearts that causes us to quit being lukewarm and starts to burn that fire or starts to give, give us that cooling relief again that we need to offer to others. And it's a festive invitation. He's not saying, I'm going to invite you to a prayer meeting. I'm going to invite you to a dinner. Hey, we're going to have a dinner at noon. We're going to be able to, to, to help the middle school kids go down to the inner cities of, of, of Lansing and of Grand Rapids this summer by helping them and supporting them in this dinner. But it's going to be an opportunity for fellowship. When the church gathers for genuine fellowship, oh, it, it's a great time. I know you might have plans, but we're going to have a dinner. Come back at noon. Be the church. Support ministry here. We are going to have a dinner. And you know the best and the greatest dinner that we could ever have, the best celebration we could ever attend, the best wedding reception we could ever go to, doesn't even compare with this invitation from Jesus to eat with him. If you will answer the door, I'll come in and we'll eat together. Wow. We will eat together. Now, I need to tell you this. If we are lukewarm in our faith, Jesus is about to spit us out. Okay, let's be real. If we're lukewarm in our faith, Jesus is about to vomit us out. That's what he says. Don't get upset at the preacher. It's what Jesus says. Please understand that he doesn't want us to be lukewarm in our faith. He calls for the church to repent. He calls for the church to refresh. He calls for the church to accept his standing invitation. To listen to the Spirit's plea upon our hearts. In 1904, William Borden was heir of the Borden Dairy Industry. He graduated from a Chicago high school as a millionaire. His parents gave him a trip around the world. And traveling through Asia, the Middle East, and Europe gave Eric William Borden 
a burden for the world's hurting people. Writing home, he said, I am going to give my life to prepare for the mission field. And when he made this decision, he wrote in the back of his Bible two words, no reserves. Turning down a high-paying job after graduating from Yale, Borden entered two more words in his Bible, no retreats. And completing his studies at Princeton Theological Seminary, Borden sailed to China to work with Muslims, stopping first in Egypt to study and learn Arama Arab uh, Aramaic. While in uh, Egypt, he was stricken with spinal meningitis, and he died within a month at the age of 25. And you know what some people would say about William Borden? They would say, what a wasted life. But when they found Eric, William Borden's Bible, they found he had written two more words. The first words when he committed himself to service was no reserves. The second words he wrote when he prepared himself for service was no retreats. And the third words he wrote on his deathbed in that Bible were no regrets. That is a man on fire. That is a Christian who is hot for God. And that's what we need to be. No reserves. No retreats. No regrets. But Jesus is all the world to us. He is our everything. This morning, Jesus is the one who, who is speaking to the church. Jesus is telling us if we have simply played at being Christians, if we have picked and chosen what we want in our faith, if we take parts of the Bible and say, I like this, but I don't like that, Jesus is saying, it's time to wake up. It's time to realize that I can't, I can't handle that when people are coasting along. I need to be hot or I need to be cold. Either way, to be refreshing. To be like Him. That's what we're supposed to be. Reflections of Christ as a congregation and reflections of Christ as individuals. He wants us hot or He wants us cold. He wants us to refresh others. If you need to come back and catch that service, let me make this an invitation to the church, to the believer, to the ones who already are baptized in their lives. Maybe you need to rededicate your life. Maybe you need to come up and stand in front of your other believers and say, I'm tired of being lukewarm. I want to be hot or I want to be cold for Jesus. Are you really willing to make a public dedication? How hot are you? How refreshing are you? Or is it just too easy to sit and do it? I know this is not an easy message. <laughs> Preacher hears himself all the time. Let's be on fire for the one who fervently loves us. Let's be this church. Now, if you need to make a decision for Christ, if you're here and you've never made a decision for Jesus, we still invite you. And you can still come forward. You can accept him and be baptized. But I'm preaching to the choir. I'm preaching to the believers. And it was Jesus preaching to the church. And he said, I'm standing at the door, and I want to come in. Are you ready to let him back in? Let's be on fire for Jesus. And if you need to make a public decision, a public affirmation of your faith, I'm invited to be this morning to stand here with me and to say, I'm tired of messing around. I'm going to live for you. And you let the Spirit lead. Are you listening to the Spirit as He speaks to your heart? You're ready. You can do something about changing your life from now on. You do it today. Let's stand together. Let's sing this song.